Okay, folks, time for the next installment of Let's Fix ISOM number two. This time we are focusing on the introduction of the new Ripaverse character Gooding in ISOM number two. We're calling this segment The Gooding, the Bad, and the Lazy. So let's pick up where we left off last episode with the introduction of some ranch hands of Avery Silman. And we don't have any dialogue or captions on this on these couple of panels. Why is that? Did I mention the lazy part? So we're just gonna have to get right into the mix of things. Thankfully, we actually get, actually get dialogue in the next panels, uh, except we're gonna have to start making some corrections right away. I've already called Gooding. We know the fire department ain't getting down here in time. Two problems with this. Number one, Gooding is a new character of significance. His name really should be italicized. The second thing is, we know the fire department ain't getting down here in time, is a little bit on the hand-holding side. Uh, we don't need to necessarily know that because if they've called Gooding, we know it's about the fire. He's either the fire department himself or he's someone who can you know, call the fire department or he's someone who can uh, maybe do something about the fire. We don't know. But let's leave that character in a little bit of mystery and uh, just kind of, okay, Gooding is somebody who apparently handles problems like this. So let's change that dialogue to just say, I've already called Gooding. He says he's on his way. Boss man, what happened in there? Where's Sam? And now we've got a hidden curse word. And if you've seen my video on how to cuss in comics, my advice is if you can't just explicitly curse, you know, like say the actual word on the page, don't you have the reader try to fill in the blank for you. Instead, use the opportunity to just say something more intelligent. For example, you're hurt, Mr. Silman. Yeah, th there's no reason to, to like try and force cursing into there. It was an ambush. I don't know where Sam is. He wasn't in there. At least I don't think he was. I don't know what this is, but it looks bad. Okay, what does she mean by this? Uh, either she's talking about his wound or she's talking about the whole situation altogether because there's a burning building in the background. Um, what is she talking about? So let's just clarify that. I don't know that wound type. It looks bad. And yeah, I know the dialogue's a little clunky, but I had to make it fit the bubble. Now we have someone bringing her a first aid pack saying, work your magic. And she says, I wish I was an actual magician. Okay, a little bit of quibble with these two dialogue balloons because here we have an opportunity first and foremost to actually start introducing these characters. I mean, one of the things that Eric July is horrible about is naming his characters and giving readers an idea of who these characters are identity wise. Let's give them at least first names so that we can start talking about them on a first name basis. And moreover, uh, this girl's thing about I wish I was an actual magician that's kind of taking the focus off of Avery's pain because uh, he's grimacing in the uh, in, in the in the super foreground there. Um, so let's change the, these dialogue balloons. Work your magic, Amy. He might need a magician, Haas. And that kind of puts the focus back onto Avery. You can kind of look and, and, and see that he's grimacing in pain there. Next couple of panels, got a, a couple of the other, uh, uh, you got another one of the uh, ranch hands saying, this can't spread much, but we've got to get this put out. And then Haas says, that explosion had all of the livestock spooked. Okay, a couple of problems here. Number one, this can't spread much actually takes, it actually drains the tension out of the scene as opposed to gives us some excitement. We want to make this a clear and present danger. We want the fire to be not just uh, an immediate problem of, well, the security house is burning down, but why not make it a much larger problem than that? Uh, and this actually kind of puts a circle, kind of circumscribes the, the amount of damage it can do. And so it makes you feel like, oh, well, I guess this isn't that much of a big deal. Um, and then that explosion had all of the livestock spooked. Okay, but that's a past problem. What about our present problem? If you're going to involve the livestock, make them in danger now. Give us more reason to be concerned. So let's change that dialogue to winds picking up. I'm worried it might spread to the spread the fire west. We'll have to drive the cattle out of its path. You see, now the now the cattle are actually in danger from this fire because of the wind. Another one of the uh, ranch hands says, Boss, you said you were ambushed? The coyotes should know better by now. The only quibble that I have with this particular dialogue balloon is I would have emphasized the word coyotes because in, 
in Texas terminology, coyotes can mean actual coyotes, or they can mean uh, human smugglers. That's what uh, the smugglers who get people from Mexico into Texas are called, is coyotes. And which one does he mean, actually? <laughs> We're not really clear. And from the remarks Avery's going to make in the next panel, it actually gives us some more ambiguity if you, if you kind of fine-tune the dialogue so that it becomes kind of a humorous statement. So, uh, so let's go over to the next panel and look at the dialogue there where he says, This is going to sound crazy, but I don't know what they were. They had fur, claws. They were standing straight up. And then uh, Haas says, He's lost a lot of blood. He may be losing it. And Amy says, maybe, but this isn't some animal attack. His skin is punctured, but also burned. If it was from the fire, it'd be all over him. It's a little bit on the Encyclopedia Brown side. She's making some uh, some Sherlock-type deductions there. And it, it just why not just report what she observes? So I'm going to tweak all of this so that the joke is a little bit better in terms of the human-animal ambiguity. And also, Amy's just basically reporting what she sees. This is going to sound crazy, but I don't think my attackers were human. They had fur and claws. You think actual coyotes hit you, boss man? This wasn't some animal attack, Hoss. Mr. Silman's skin is punctured, but also burned, like somebody injected fire right into the wound. Moving on, we've got uh, a drone appearing in the sky over the building. And uh, one of the ranch hands looks up and says, what the... And then he grabs his gun saying, we've got company. And a voice in the distance says, I, right as the uh, uh, drone starts releasing some sort of fire retardant. And uh, then off the panel, we've got somebody saying, let me do my job. And I keep wanting to read this in groundskeeper Willie's voice. You know, I, let me do my job. Because who the hell says I? I mean, this, this it's an affectation of gooding speech that it, it appears nowhere else. Uh, and, and certainly Eric July doesn't Chris Claremont his dialogue later on. So he's like Banshee, you know, Faith and Begora and all this kind of crap. Um, I, I don't even know why that's there. But uh, in any case, there's a few problems that I want to rectify in these panels. First is in this particular scene, you've already got the drone releasing fire retardant. And if you want to maintain the tension as to why those drones are there, you don't want to reveal their purpose right away. So let's remove that part where they're actually uh, spreading the fire retardant already. And that way, the guy who is um, pulling his gun is looking at those drones saying, what the heck is up there? Moreover, let's leave this panel ambiguous in its entirety. Don't, don't start diffusing it right away. Don't use this panel as the snuffing out of the fuse. Let's keep the fuse lit on the tension. We have these drones. He's going to, he's going to attack the drones. And then only on the next page should we start diffusing things. So we'll remove that dialogue balloon. And then we've got another problem. And I'll give you a hint on what that problem is. Yeah, if you know me, you know this means something. What does this mean? Let's see what the other problem is. Can you spot it? Can you spot the problem? Come on, I gave you a hint. All right, here it is. His hat's the wrong color. Look at the two pages of uh, the ranch hands coming in. Um, he's got two, uh, let's see, you've got Haas with the light brown or the lighter brown hat. You've got Amy with no hat. And then you've got the two other ranch hands and they both got dark hats. Who's the guy with the light brown hat? There isn't one. So this guy needs a dark hat. <laughs> okay, so now uh, we need to fix up the uh, dialogue portion where Gooding is introducing himself. And uh, let's just tack that in on the right-hand side. I, you do have company. Now let me do my job. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't stop reading it in the groundskeeper Willie voice. Because it's like, who says that? Who says I? <laughs> All right. So now we have the introduction of, da 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 Gooding. On foot? Okay. Somebody needs to explain this to me. Because here's the thing, the ranch hands, when they arrived on the scene, they were on horses, which means wherever they came from, they weren't just coming on foot, they were coming on horseback. Now, the average speed of a horse at a gallop is about 30 miles an hour. The average speed of a human being at a run, even if he's in good physical shape, is about 10 miles an hour. That means it's going to take Gooding like three times longer to reach whatever, you know, from wherever he was. And let's assume he was not at the same distance 
from the ranch uh, that that from the uh, security house fire that the ranch hands were, he more likely than not would have been farther away. So we really need to find some way to explain to the reader in this scene, since the art doesn't do it, how in the hell did Gooding get there so fast? Now there are some clues in later panels. We have this robot dog in the next panel. You can see him right there. And for some reason, the robot dog does not appear in the previous panel that introduces Gooding, and maybe that's important. Moreover, we know from later panels that this dog can sprout wings and fly. So it's a flying robot dog. And moreover, we've got this thing in Gooding's hand that looks kind of like a collapsible bar. Uh, and it's not in his hand at the next scene, which means that he apparently doesn't need it anymore. So I don't really see, unless unless the idea was that he was applying those to his face mask, but that wasn't at all, um, that was not at all clear. In any case, I'm not going to use it for that. I'm going to use that as if it were a collapsible bar, and uh, then I'm going to use that in tandem with the drones to come up with a plausible story as to how Gooding got there so fast. So let's take it from the top. I'm not going to add the captions directly into the artwork because as it is a full portrait page, uh, that would make the text too small to see. So I'm just going to put the text out to the side. And here is how I would have introduced Gooding in this page. He hits the ground running, dropped from the sky by a trinity of drones linked in tandem. The bar from which he hung collapses in his hand, just one of his smaller miracles. He calls himself Gooding. He's a polymath with an IQ of 200, an arsenal of self-developed tech at his command, and an inclination to run toward danger like the secrets of the universe are waiting there. Because they usually are, he says. He's Shadow Valley's resident jack-of-all-trades, and today that trade is first responder. So now we have to explain the presence of the robot dog, who was not in the previous panel, so we'll put that directly into the uh, artwork like this. The middle transport drone of the three detaches and descends to the ground, converting into a kind of robot dog. Okay, that explains why there's a robot dog there. Now, there is this uh, uh, blurb from the robot dog saying, scan complete, no life detected, except he never asks for a scan, so let's have him ask for a scan. Fido, life scan! Scan complete, no life detected. Secure the second floor. I'll take care of the gas line. I still want to read him like Groundskeeper Willie. Uh, engaging. So now he runs in, and now, now, we're going to see Gooding really get into action because he's going to start using all his mental acuity to figure out how to stop the fire uh, with the assistance of his drone in the smartest and most efficient way possible. And we are just going to be absolutely amazed by how he, you know, brings this, like, Tony Stark intelligence to the problem and solves it. That's what we're going to see because that's what's implied in this panel. This is what's coming up. So when we turn the page, nope, nope. Meanwhile, back at the Nut Ranch. <sighs> wow. Instead of actually showing us what Gooding can do, we get three pages of what is essentially product placement. Because, honestly, that's all that this scene is. This is an alpha core scene in which they're basically complaining at each other about at how badly they performed in the last issue of ISOM and uh, talking a little bit about Yaira and giving her really absolutely no background, more than we knew before. Um, they just kind of kvetch at each other and then go away. It, it's such a terrible scene that I am not even going to try to... Um, Fix this dialogue until I get a chance to read Chuck Dixon's Alpha Core. Please, God, Chuck Dixon, do something with these characters. Do something, please. Oh, because this is some of the most lackluster stuff that I have seen in a long time. Um, yeah. Yep, sometimes there's no fixing something. Uh, th honestly, I would say that if he really wanted to interrupt the flow of the story just to give himself a break and, and, and allow him to, himself to skip over entirely having to put in any work at making Gooding's uh, fighting the fire a credible, believable thing, then I would have said just put ads in the middle of the book. You know, break up the flow that way. I would have, you would have done better with an ad for AlphaCore and an ad for Yaira than three pages of this miserable dreck that I had to slog through.
when I want what I wanted to know was, okay, what's Gooding going to do next? <sighs> and you know, the sad part is, is that I get the feeling that he's like, okay, I have no idea how Gooding's going to fight this fire. And instead of doing actual research, like going to the local firehouse and saying, hey, how do you fight a fire? Um, what, what would one guy in a suit do about fighting a fire? And, I, I, you know, I don't know. I would just walk down to the local firehouse and ask those guys, like, you know, if you were one guy and you had to stop a fire by yourself, and but you had robot drones at your command, what would you do with that? And let them, you know, shoot out some ideas. You know, maybe they'd have some things uh, that would sound interesting. And, you know, worst case, you just make up something that sounds good. But to just leave us hanging like that. Oh, it was brutal. It was brutal uh, turning the page and finding myself in an alpha core mess. So, uh, so I would at least put in, at, in this panel, a couple of throwaway lines like, okay, fire, show me what you got. And, uh, and that way, it, it, it at least gives you a sense of conclusion where the next page could be anything. And then when you get into this alpha core thing, it's not such a jarring transition. Okay, so once we uh, have allowed Gooding his time to miraculously fight the fire, uh, we come back to, and, and we're done with the Alpha Corps, just ramble. We're back at Silman Ranch, and uh, first thing we get is a dialogue talking about the horses, apparently, where, he, where the ranch hand says, I see they're getting nosy, let me get them back to work. Um, this is one of my pet peeves with uh, Eric July's writing. You'll see it in uh, various other places in... Uh, 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 in in ISOM number two, especially in the beginning sequence where you have, uh, uh, and actually in the Alpha Core sequence as well, which I didn't show and which I won't show because I don't want to like hurt your eyes with that. Um, using pronouns when you, you don't even really need to. I see they're getting nosy. Let me get them back to work. It's like you know you don't you don't have to make the reader work on every single panel. Just tell them it's the horses. The horses are getting nosy. Let me get them back to work. Now, I'm not going to reprint all the dialogue here because it's not all relevant, but uh, Gooding says, mind telling me what happened? And uh, Avery says, would you even believe me if I told you? And honestly, in the Ripaverse, I don't understand the skepticism because you have, you know that there are men who can fly. There are women who wield energy whips. There are women who can fly and throw ice blasts. Why would there be skepticism about the existence of beasts that, uh, that, that, that immolate themselves and, and can set other things on fire in the process? That doesn't really make sense to me that he would think that Gooding would be skeptical, skeptical about that because Gooding is a polymath. He's well-versed in various forms of science and knowledge, and that's what polymath means. And why... Why would he expect skepticism from Gooding? I, 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 don't, I don't get that. There's a, another little line of dialogue here that seems at cross purposes with Gooding's insatiable curiosity, and polymaths are by and large insatiably curious. He says, it cost, of course, it'll cost you a little extra for a full investigation. And I wonder if that's actually part of his character. And I'm not saying this dialogue is wrong. It just kind of jars a little bit because he seems to be limiting himself, but maybe he has to limit himself. If so, I would hope Mike Barron picks up on this and, and makes that part of his character in that he wants to investigate everything, but he knows he can't. And so the people who will pay for his services, those are the investigations that will actually get his attention. And that is how he will keep himself from investigating absolutely everything. But he wants to, and, and it's clear that he wants to from the next couple of panels and the dialogue that we see there, especially, you should for sure commission me to investigate this for you. And uh, he is really seeming to be prodding Avery, like hire me for this, hire me for this. You know, the paranormal occurrences, missing persons case, I really wanna investigate this. And, and right at the end, he's saying, I'm begging you, let me give you a detailed look and try to solve this case. And it, it can't be any clearer that he really, really, really wants to work on this. But again, I guess his code is if the guy's not going to pay for his services, then he's going to have to turn his attention elsewhere because otherwise he's going to wind up investigating everything in the world for free, which is only going to be harmful to himself. So, of course, we do get the business card from, uh, from the robot drone, and uh, that leads to the 
uh, infamous Gooding service panel where you've got the uh, I that shouldn't be there, and uh, Eric July's already acknowledged that flub. But why is it called fire extinguishing instead of firefighting? I, I've never heard firefighting referred to as fire extinguishing. Just just offhand, I mean, that's it, it's just a quibble, but I, I, it's one of those things where when something looks different from it usually is in the real world, it makes you wonder if that's something significant but it probably isn't in this case. I just think firefighting would have made more sense there. Now, the last few panels in the sequence, this, these are all on the same page, uh, show Avery coming home to his house saying, thank God there ain't another set of those to light my actual house on fire. And then he collapses on the couch, achy and exhausted, and he's drifting off. And there's so much wasted space on this page. I mean, there's so much opportunity to layer this. And uh, I, I mean, it's just, it's just, and considering how little we learned about Gooding, what I would have liked to see is more about Gooding explained here, where Avery is telling what he knows of Gooding. So uh, you're, <laughs> it's just, it's just, frankly, it's just lazy that Eric July doesn't make use of the space that has been given to him in order to communicate what is going on inside Avery's head or more about the characters that are in Avery's world. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to give a demonstration of what I would have liked to have seen on this page. And the first thing that I'm going to have to do, of course, is fix this freaking dialogue balloon, which uses pronouns again. Thank God there ain't another set of those to light my actual house on fire. Another set of what? All right, stop making the reader do all of your lifting for you and just say, thank God there ain't another set of beasts to light my actual house on fire. I mean, it's, it's, when it's just a word, you know, help the reader out. Come on. It's just silly not to, not to just say what you mean. All right. And now I'm going to put in all of the captions I would have added to explain more about the character of Gooding. So here we go. Gooding's smart, but a little strange. He's so desperate to figure out a new challenge. Thought he might actually cry when I declined his services. Haas told me he and Gooding loosened up over a few beers once. Found out Gooding isn't his real name. When Gooding was young, he was sent to a special school that was hella strict. Students were forced to answer questions while tied to electrodes. If you answered a question right, a bell would ding. If you answered a question wrong, you didn't want to get a question wrong. Messed the kid up so bad that when his mom was dying of cancer, the only thing he could ask her was, Mom, I've dinged good for you, haven't I? Have I dinged good, Mom? Oh, honey, she said, you are my good ding. And there you have it. There is the introduction of Gooding from ISOM number two and how I would have uh, added some stuff in there. Um, next time we will actually be going backwards in the book because we needed to get to this point before I could fully address one of the pivotal moments that's actually featured on the cover of ISOM number two, which is mainly why did ISOM quit? So I will be going back to cover the years ago experience of Avery's uh, fight with Chadron, which is featured on the cover of uh, ISOM number two, cover A. And uh, I will also be covering his reaction to learning that Darren has attacked Altona in her place of work and seeing how the two of those really link together. Because one of the things that I felt was that the psychology behind uh, Avery's fighting Shadron, the motivation for him to quit as a result of that fight, and the uh, resulting tie-in to things in the modern world as to why he would still not want to return to the fray, isn't really cleared up very well by that sequence of panels. And I'm going to have to do a lot of rewriting on account and, and additional writing on account of that to make it all make sense. So... It may take a while for me to get that video out. Don't be surprised if it's not until next week that I can uh, put that all together. Uh, thank you for watching. I'm Mike Partika. Please do subscribe so that you can get notified on uh, future installments of Let's Fix ISOM number two. I'm also hoping that uh, in the near future, I will finally 
be getting my uh, Cyber Frog Wrecked Planet shipments. I'm expecting about four books in that. And uh, one of these days, depending on uh, depending on what is offered in the uh, Cyber Frog Green Supremacy or uh, campaign, I may be doing a Let's Fix Cyber Frog Blood Honey in the future. I'm I'm really thinking about that. Of course, I'm going to need an extra copy of the most recent version to cannibalize for scans. Um, so it just depends on uh, what becomes available. Uh, when Cyber Frog Volume 4 comes out probably in 2024 or 2025. So uh, anyway, uh, just letting you know a little bit about what's going on into the future. And uh, thank you again for watching. I'm Mike Bartika. Do subscribe so that you will get notified of future videos. And I will talk to you later.